Hello, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing this St Hilda's in the City event. Um, I'm tantalisingly close to St Hilda's in Cowley, but it's great to be welcoming alumni and friends from York, Plymouth, London, Edinburgh, um, and even as far away as New York, Washington, Thailand and Finland. So welcome, everybody. I'm Dr Eva Worth. I'm the Jenny Wormold JRF in History here at St Hilda's, and I research women's history in the 20th century. So this talk is particularly um, fascinating to me and relevant to my research. I'm delighted to be welcoming Rebecca Walker, um, one of our alumni, um, to speak today. She read English at St Hilda's. She then embarked on a highly successful career in the police force. After training with the Sussex Police, she transferred to the City of London Police, where she is the force's lead and first ever FEMA. Police search advisor, maintaining security in the city's historical landmarks for royal and state events. Fascinated by the hidden histories of the metropolis, she was a key advisor in the City Police Museum's move to the Guildhall Library in 2016. And she's a historian with behind the scenes experience of London's historic square mile. She's in demand for talks and tours and is historical advisor on projects such as suffragettes with Lucy Worsley. So today she's going to be speaking on um, suffragettes and outrages. Um, so she's going to be talking about particularly the methods and later terror, how methods, the suffragettes methods and how their and how later terror campaigns were influenced by the suffragettes. So this is kind of a particularly interesting and original angle on the topic of the suffragettes. I'm very excited um, to be welcoming her today. So I'm going to be passing over to Rebecca and she's going to, I think, hopefully be sharing some slides that we can all look at as well. Thank you very much, Eve, for that introduction. Um, and hello to everybody this evening. I'm talking to you from the depths of uh, rural Sussex, and hopefully the broadband connection will stand up here. I'll just swap to the slides now, which hopefully everybody can see, and I'll get rid of the subtitles there. So as Eve said, tonight's talk is about the suffragette outrages from bombs to the ballot box. Now, I actually didn't really realise that the suffragettes had conducted a bombing campaign, probably until Fern Riddell um, published her book, Death in 10 Minutes, a few years back. And I was rather intrigued by this because I knew that one of the edicts from Mrs. Pankhurst, the suffragettes, had been, um, don't harm people. And I have a particular expertise in, in bombs and explosives, which I'll explain why in a minute, perfectly uh, lawful reason for my interest. And I didn't see how you could reconcile this, this edict of not harming people with actually using explosive devices. So we're gonna have a look at the type of bombs that the suffragettes built and exactly how harmful they were and how they correspond with bombs constructed by other terrorist groups such as the IRA and the anarchists and the precursors to the IRA, the Fenians. So we'll be going back to the 1880s. Now I mentioned my uh, lawful interest in bombs. Um, as Eve mentioned, I'm a police officer. I joined Sussex Police in 1993 and transferred to the City of London in 2004. And I'm actually a police officer for another 19 days because um, I shall be retiring then. And I feel that I need to add, as we're gonna be talking about bombs and a little bit about how you make bombs, please try, do not try any of this at home because I'd quite like to make my um, retirement and also get my pension unharmed. Before we fully begin, could I just jump in and ask you to share your slides with us? Oh. Sorry. Stand by. Ooh. Yep. Yeah, we're there. Yeah, I just want to make them full screen. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. But under a bit close tonight. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned about um, being a police officer. Um, and in policing, you can follow various specialisms if you wish. Um, you'll have seen some of my colleagues out recently at the Black um, Lives Matter protests who are trained public order officers. I trod another path and I went down the route of uh, police specialist search, which was a discipline that started in the 1980s um, after the Brighton bomb, when the IRA almost successfully wiped out the cabinet of the time, Margaret Thatcher's cabinet. 
And it was decided that a system of systematic search needed to be introduced for venues before important events, which meant that basically you would search them for bombs. And some of those techniques have now been extended um, to crime searches and uh, missing people searches as well. I did a four week training course at the Police National Search Centre being trained by police officers and also um, the Royal Engineers who are really the specialists in this. They often form bomb disposal teams. Um, and as a result of that, I can now plan and run police searches using a variety of resources, which can go from people who are trained in specialist search um, through to ground penetrating radar, explosive swabbing and the like. And a big bit of the course was around bombs and how bombs are um, constructed, what the explosive effects are of various types of explosives. So I think it's fair to say that I do have a certain expertise in this matter. And if you do happen to see me out on a live search over the next 19 days or so, um, and you see me start to run, I suggest that you, uh, you take appropriate action and follow me rather quickly. But now to the main stars of tonight's show. Who are the suffragettes, who were particularly the women of, uh, of the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU. They became familiarly known as, as the suffragettes, founded in 1903 by uh, Emmeline Pankhurst and her two daughters initially, and their aim was to uh, achieve votes for women. They adopted the slogan of deeds, not words. And as, as we'll see, they, they weren't really into jaw jaw, they were more into war war, if you like. Um, certainly deeds was the thing that they were about. And although that, that slogan perhaps doesn't have too much of a resonance for us, it probably would have done for the Edwardians of the time. In 1881, the anarchist movement had had a congress in London. Now the anarchists are really associated with chaos, chaos and disorder. What they were about was they didn't really want an established hierarchy. They thought that without government, society would be able to regulate itself. And they decided at this Congress that um, they would adopt a strategy of propaganda by deed. So echoes here, deeds, not words, propaganda by deed. Um, and their deeds basically um, were assassinations. They were phenomenally successful at assassinating establishment figures prime ministers, um, premiers, royalty, and also bombing campaigns. And they had planted or tried to plant a couple of bombs um, in the capital during the 1890s, not successfully. One bomber who was, we think, targeting Greenwich Observatory as he went across the park, accidentally detonated the device that he was carrying and blew himself up. And it might be a story that's familiar to you because it was taken later by Joseph Conrad and was actually the central story of his novel, The Secret Agent. Now the sorts of deeds that the suffragettes were up to, some of them are probably pretty familiar to you. So they would chain themselves to railings, they would take part in protests, and, and there you have probably, I would imagine one of the most famous pictures of Emmeline Pankhurst being carried away by a Metropolitan Police inspector um, from a protest in Whitehall. They were very fond of breaking windows and they became increasingly fond of um, setting fire to post boxes. And that picture there is from December um, 1912. And I think from memory, that is very likely to have been a post box that was set fire to by one um, Emily Wilding Davidson, who would later make her name, if you like, by throwing herself in front of the King's horse at the Derby. Um, and she received fatal injuries from that. And she writes in her papers about going up to the City of London on a bus, taking with her paraffin soaked rags um, and a box of matches and quite simply walking around and selecting post boxes at random. And other things that the suffragettes would get up to, would they would go and set fire to churches and farm buildings and haystacks. They would cut telegraph and telephone wires and they would rope together railway signals as well. All slightly dangerous things, uh, bringing with them possible um, harm to life, but also remarkably simple. You don't actually need any training at all to do it. 
You don't really need any specialized equipment. Um, and anybody can go off and do it on their own, if you like, as Wilding Davidson did. Probably the sort of person that today we, we'd speak of as a lone wolf um, in the world of terrorism who goes off, um, just takes undertakes acts on their own. And of course, by doing that without any particular organization behind them, they're actually much more difficult for the security services and the police to stop. Now, this is from uh, the Illustrated London News from about May 1913. And it lays out quite nicely the progress here of the militant suffragettes. So that's Emmeline Pankhurst's suffragettes, who started off by lobbying MPs and pavement chalking through to arson, through to window breaking, and it says there through to bombing. And the campaign steadily um, grew to these sort of acts from about 1905 onwards when the suffragettes realized that simply by talking wasn't gonna get them the vote. Now, one of their most notable bombing attacks was on this place in February, 1913. And as hopefully you can see from the photograph, it says there that it's Mr. Lord Lloyd George's house at Walton on the Hill down in Surrey. Now, Lloyd George was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. The Suffolk viewed him really as a false friend. He kind of made promises to them and then reneged on them. So they decided that he was really quite fair game. And as you can see, they decided that they were going to blow his house up. And there's a news article there which tells us about the attempt that was made on the house, that there were two devices planted there. People arrive at the premises 20 minutes after the explosion has happened. So it's quite a close run thing. And it says that it was it was an attack claimed by Mrs. Pankhurst. And indeed, she did claim it. She she actually said that she had conspired and incited others to commit it. And it is very likely that one of the others who committed it was once again, Emily Wilding Davidson, who went along um, to Lloyd George's premises and helped to set the bombs. And I'll just read you from the report of Her Majesty's Inspector of Explosives about the damage that was caused. The ceiling of the room in which the explosion occurred was entirely blown away. A partition wall was almost demolished. The outer wall was bulged outwards and there was damage to ceilings and walls um, in the neighboring rooms. Now, important thing for me there as a police search advisor looking at the power of the explosive is the reference to the fact that the outer wall was bulged outwards. So that's a fairly substantial supporting wall. And the bomb that the suffragettes have put there has been powerful enough to do that. So what did they actually use? Well, their, their main charge, their explosive, was gunpowder. So the sort of thing that you get in fireworks. And the bomb was round about five pounds, five pounds of, of gunpowder. So you're looking at two, two kilograms or more visually about two and a half bags of sugar. And how did they make it explode? Well, it was a remarkably rudimentary device. Very simple to put this together. Again, please don't try this at home. They took a candle and they put it into a saucer and they surrounded it by sawdust that they'd soaked in some sort of an accelerant. So think petrol or paraffin. They then got a rag that was soaked um, in accelerant as well and put it in the end of the saucer underneath the, the sawdust. And then they attached it to the charge of gunpowder. And then they quite simply lit the candle and left. And they waited for the candle to burn down, acting as a timer in effect. It then set fire uh, to the sawdust and the rag and the fire makes the gunpowder explode. The reason the second device didn't explode um, was very probably because one device went off first and it actually blew the candle out on the second device. So it wasn't able to detonate because it, it didn't have um, the flame from the candle. Again, very rudimentary. You don't need a particular expertise, um, but clearly extremely effective. But there's a risk. As I've mentioned, you have your workmen arriving on site um, only 20 minutes after the bomb has gone off. Could this device have killed or injured somebody? Well, for me, it's a very definite yes. And I base that on the fact that in 1999, a neo-Nazi called David Copeland 
conducted a bombing campaign in London. He planted a bomb in Brixton, um, and the one that might resonate with you was the one at the Admiral Duncan pub up in Soho in London. About three people were killed, about 70 were injured, uh, four people had to have limbs amputated afterwards. What did he use? Well, he used a five pound charge of gunpowder. No high explosives, simply gunpowder. And the injuries um, that people received were actually made worse by the fact that Copeland was a, a nail bomber. He wrapped his explosives in nails. And people who wrapped their explosives in nails or shrapnel uh, of some sort, like nuts or bolts, really do that because they want to enhance the damage either to people um, or to property. Now, after February, the suffragettes carry on with various civil disobedient activities with arson and such like. And they also start to do some reconnaissance in the city of London. And you have there a document from uh, the National Archives. Um, this was seized in a raid on a, a suffragette supporters premises. And you can see there they've given various code names to stations up in London. And there's evidence that one of their supporters, a chap called Edward Clayton, who's actually quite important in the explosive story, and I'll come to him a little bit more later on, he would go out and do hostile reconnaissance for the suffragettes, which means he would go out and look at likely premises where they plant bombs. And featuring in the literature up the Bishopsgate Institute, which is an institute up at the northern end of Bishopsgate in the city, and also the Guildhall Library at the Guildhall, which ironically, when I show you a couple of the, the only two remaining suffragette bombs in existence, they're both now housed in the City of London Police Museum, which is at the Guildhall Library. And so to the City of London itself. Um, the city is often um, the focal point of protests or attacks. The IRA particularly liked it. Uh, more recently, we've had protests against G8 um, and Extinction Rebellion, and they very often focus on Bank Junction. And that's a photograph there of Bank Junction in the, the centre of the city. And if hopefully you can see my cursor in the middle there, that there is the Bank of England. Over here we have the Royal Exchange. And here we have the Mansion House. And just at the back here, you can see the difference in the two buildings between the Bank of England and the, and the premises at the back. There's a lane there called Bartholomew Lane. And over here in this premises at that time um, was the Stock Exchange. It's moved since to Paternoster Square. Um, but in about 1813, it was based at the back of the Bank of England. Now, there have been people who planted bombs in this area before. The Fenians planted a bomb at the Mansion House in 1881 that was discovered and diffused by a passing police officer before it went off. The anarchists also tried to attack the Royal Exchange, although there's some doubt about that. There's some suspicion they might actually have got confused and they meant to attack the Stock Exchange, but for some reason they went for the Royal Exchange instead. And the big mistake that the anarchists made was they actually went to an ironmonger's in Blackfriars in the city to commission um, a specially made pipe to put their bomb in. And the ironmonger became very suspicious of these two individuals who kept coming back, tweaking their order. Um, and he actually reported them to the police. Um, the police came along and arrested them and they admitted the fact that they were gonna mount an attack on the city. This is something that the suffragettes never did. They never fell foul of this. And this is because they were extremely innovative in how they parceled up their bombs. They raided their larders and their kitchens. They went down to the bike shed. They went to their bedside tables to take various items to use to make bombs from or to put into bombs. So in many of their bombs, you'd find something like a hairpin that would hold various bits of the bomb together. In a minute, we'll see a milk can bomb, we'll see a mustard tin bomb. They plant a bomb at Westminster Abbey, which the explosive expert says he believes it was housed in a bicycle bomb with possibly part of a handbell within it as well. So they repurposed items that were very often associated with female domesticity and used them in a campaign to get the vote, something that men, um, the patriarchal society of the time, was actually trying to stop them from doing. 
And I mentioned a milk can bomb. Well, this milk can bomb was planted down Bartholomew Lane, uh, which I just pointed out on the previous slide, um, in the city of London in April 1913. And it signifies a little bit of a, a change really in the suffragette campaign. Previously, they'd only really attacked areas where they weren't expecting people to be. They were expecting them to be empty. This bomb was discovered around about 11 o'clock in the morning, down Bartholomew Lane, next to an entrance to the Bank of England and opposite the entrance to the Stock Exchange. So it's a, you see, it's a, a pretty busy area. It's difficult to get an idea of, of size um, from this photograph here, but this contained a pound of gunpowder. So think half a bag of sugar, but it also had workings in it. Now these workings hadn't really been seen um, before. They'd been seen once before in a suffragette bomb. So if we think of Lloyd George's house, we had the candle and the rags and the paraffin and sawdust. Now we have a container with gunpowder within it. When it was opened up, they found that there was a watch in there as well and a battery. And this item that you see here on the top is what's called a switch. And that's basically what it does. It turns the bomb on. So you have to, you have to set the switch in order for the bomb to go off. It's a bit like your central heating system. So you can program the timer on your central heating system, but unless you put your um, on and off button to on, it's not gonna come on, it's not gonna work. So this is the first time that we've seen in the city, um, a suffragette device that basically uses a timer an electrical circuit. So it's a, a massive advance from simply using um, candles. Um, the significant thing about this as well is that it's quite small, so it's portable. It's a ready-made bomb. So whereas Davidson and our colleagues at Lloyd George's house needed time and privacy to build their bomb in situ, that's not the case anymore. The suffragettes can build portable bombs using household items they can set the time for whenever they like, and they can go and plant them. And these are the sort of items, this milk can and the mustard tin, as we'll see at the minute, that women could quite plausibly carry around. They just have to be a little bit careful about disguising the top of it here. So um, that attention wasn't drawn to that. This bomb was followed the following month by, as I mentioned, the mustard tin bomb. Again, quite difficult to get a sense of, of size from this, um, but it was planted in St. Paul's Cathedral um, by the Bishop's throne. It failed to detonate, um, but it's an extremely sophisticated device. It was really, I think, user error that meant that it failed to detonate. There was a bit of correspondence between the explosive expert and Canon Newbolt of the cathedral, because Canon Newbolt was pretty convinced because it hadn't gone off, that it, it was a hoax. And the suffragettes did use hoax devices. They would plant them around London um, and around the UK as well in an attempt to, to cause disruption. Um, but Major Cooper Key, who was um, former Royal Engineer, he was the man who got the job most of the time of looking at the suffragette bombs afterwards. He describes it as being uh, having wires that were carefully insulated in glass tubes connected at the ends by a bridge a fine platinum wire, so fine as to be easily rendered incandescent by the current from the small battery. And he actually said in a separate part of the letter that he wrote to Canon Newbolt about the, uh, about the bomb, that that wire was so fine, it was about the thickness of a human hair. The switch, which again is the thing that you see on the top there, was of a similar design to that on an electric lamp, the handle itself being the only part visible so that it was impossible to tell by merely turning the switch, whether it was on or off without taking the lid off the box and so interfering with the igniting machinery. A mistake might therefore easily have occurred. What Cooper Key is saying there is that basically the person who planted the bomb failed to switch it on. Now it's a mistake that has been made since by the IRA. I remember doing some, some training as part of a Pulsar course, where we were told about part of the IRA campaign in Northern Ireland, 
where they were finding a lot of bombs that simply didn't go off and they didn't go off because they hadn't turned them on basically, um, which they couldn't understand because there was the word on printed on the bomb. So they knew where the switch had to be put. And then they started to find bombs that did actually go off. And when they were recovering parts of them, they found that now you didn't just have the word on, you also had the word off. So it was quite clear which setting was which. And they puzzled out that the, the reason that the earlier bombs were just on, on, had probably failed to go off was because the bomb setter, perhaps in their panic when the adrenaline's going and they're putting the bomb down, isn't reading the word on, but is actually reading the word no. And what self-respecting bomb setter is going to set a bomb switch to something that says no? And that may well have explained why they were failing to detonate. They then up the game, the suffragettes, that this is the following year where they move from St Paul's down to Westminster Abbey. And they attack Westminster Abbey shortly before six o'clock in the evening. But as that little extract from the newspaper says there, um, it, it says that, that there weren't too many people in the cathedral at the time, but there were still people there as well. And the explosion was actually so violent, um, it was heard as far away as the Houses of Parliament. It also says there that a couple of women were questioned and then released because the, the, the suspicion immediately fell upon women as being suffragettes. And interestingly, after this um, explosion, many institutions in London um, brought in a system of bag searching for women. So we're very used to that today, probably sometimes going through search arches and having our bags searched. Um, well, this was brought in then in, in 1914, where women would have their bags searched. And again, it's a kind of a testament to the fact that these suffragettes were walking around with very portable devices. Now, this bomb is particularly um, significant. There are some extracts here that I'll put up from, again, from the report of Her Majesty's Inspector of Explosives. It was Cooper Key, once again, who visited the scene. And he speaks about um, the fragments from the bomb itself, which would um, be broken up during the explosion. And he mentions that these are at a considerable distance from the seat of the explosion. And you not only have portions of steel, but you also have several heavy steel hexagonal nuts, a little under an inch in diameter. So again, this is a bomb that has been packed with shrapnel, additional shrapnel, which if you look at the IRA, if you look at um, Copeland's campaign, those were added to various bombs simply because you wanted to cause more damage or, or more harm to human beings. Cooper Key also mentions the explosion might have been fired by the action of sulfuric acid. And I think this was probably the case. Now, what does that actually mean in English? Well, what the suffragettes did on this occasion was they would have had say a layer of explosive. Above that, there was flocking. And above that, they would have had a file containing sulfuric acid. In order to prime the bomb, they would have broken the file of sulfuric acid, which slowly would have leaked through the flocking um, and into the explosive underneath, and then it would have exploded. Now, hopefully, um, from that, you get the gist of the fact that this is an extremely imprecise science. The IRA have used sulfuric acid as a timer and as an initiator to make the explosive explode, but it is incredibly dangerous thing to do. And Cooper Key does actually mention in his report um, that the person who set the bomb must have been extremely brave because there was no way that you could judge to a nicety how long it would take for that sulfuric acid to work its way through the flocking and actually cause the explosion. And he reckoned that it exploded probably far sooner than the bomb, than the bomb setter actually thought. And lastly, again, another really significant advance for the suffragettes here. We've talked a lot about gunpowder before, and here's Cooper Key saying, the explosion was caused by a small quantity of fairly
velocity at which those portions of it which struck the stonework must have been traveling. The velocity gives us a clue as to the facts of how powerful this explosive was. They've now moved on from gunpowder, which does the job as you'll see from fireworks, but it's nowhere near uh, as powerful as what's known as high explosive. They're now making it at home. Someone is making homemade explosive now. So they've moved on from candles and gunpowder to making their own explosive, building bombs using a variety of timers, whether we're looking at using sulfuric acid or whether they're looking at using uh, wristwatches. Now, inevitably, we had the doubters in the audience. Um, they said, well, how do you actually know that it was the suffragettes who were doing all, all this bombing, that they planted a bomb in St Paul's? Um, and he was very sceptical about these bombs, which were always conveniently discovered before they go off. Well, hopefully, as, as we've seen, um, they sometimes don't go off simply because of human error. But the suffragettes were quite keen on claiming responsibility for the devices that they set. And this was wrapped around the bomb at St Paul's. The suffragettes had their own newspaper called The Suffragette. Um, and they're also quite keen, as, as often terrorist groups are, um, in later years of reprisal bombings. The officers had been raided of the WSPU shortly before the bomb um, was planted at St Paul's. And you can see the reference, that's their front page there, and that's the page they've chosen to wrap around the bomb. So they would be quite keen on claiming um, responsibility for certain acts, and certainly the suffragette would have a roundup um, every week of various activities around the country, whether they were arson or bomb attacks, um, implicitly claiming responsibility for them in many cases. And we don't just have the naysayers about, well, how do we know it's the suffragettes? We also have the Mr Angry's of the world. And Mr Angry wrote the Northampton Chronicle, um, as we can see here. And he basically says, it, it, it just couldn't have been women that built these bombs. It's simply impossible that it could be women. Or if, if it was women, then they must have been aided by a person or person practised in the construction of these contrivances. He's rather conveniently left out the word male person or persons there, but that's obviously the gist of, of what he's getting at. Um, and I think it's quite a good illustration of the sexist attitudes that the, the suffragette felt that they were really banging their head against much of the time. But he does raise a really interesting point about who was building these things, because these, these bombs are pretty advanced, they're pretty good. Um, and I'm afraid to say I probably can't enlighten you on that, because there's not really any evidence um, or real evidence about who the bomb makers were. And this is really in contrast to the Fenians. Now, the Fenians were the, the early forerunners, if you like, of the IRA. They undertook something that became known as the Dynamite Wars in London in the 1880s. And they benefited from being able to attend a school of dynamite in Brooklyn in America. Now, Brooklyn had quite a high proportion of Irish residents. Um, and they all wanted to see Ireland liberated. Um, and there was a man called Donovan Rosser, who was instrumental behind setting up the school of dynamite. And he was instrumental behind the campaign um, of, of bombings um, back in the UK. And he engaged the services of a Professor Mezerov. Now Mezerov, very Russian um, sounded, very unlikely to be Russian, but of Russian ancestry. Very likely really to have been a man called Richard Rogers, who um, had a liquor store somewhere, I think in New York. Um, but Mezerov or Rogers, he knew his bombs. He was a very good bomb maker. And the School of Dynamite was exactly that. You could go there to learn how to build bombs um, for whatever cause um, you wanted to plant them in aid of. And he taught a lot of members of the Fenian Brotherhood and they had a bit of a cascade system going on. So people would go to him in Brooklyn and be taught how to build bombs. They would then go across to Ireland or to England and they in turn would teach people um, how to build bombs in turn. And you can see there, perhaps highlights the difference. If we think back to the, the suffragettes and their candles, and then their timing devices using watches and sulfuric acid. 
That's uh, an excerpt again from Her Majesty's in Inspector of Explosives, a report from the 1880s of a bomb that failed to explode. I believe it was from Victoria Station. Like the later IRA, the Fenians were very, very keen on transport infrastructure. Um, they planted a bomb uh, at Victoria, failed to go off, and this is a sketch of the firing device. So that is the thing that basically would have made the bomb go off. So your timer would have worked. It would have got to the time that you'd set for the explosion. What should have happened was the pistol should then have fired and set off the explosive. So really quite a, a complicated device. And obviously the more complicated they are, the more likely there is for something to go wrong with them. And obviously the, the suffragettes didn't quite hit that level of, of expertise. But they did have a certain level of expertise. Now, fries cocoa, what has that got to do with the suffragettes? Well, I mentioned a gentleman earlier on. It's about to see his name invited there. We Godwin Clayton. And here we have an advert for fries cocoa from again about the 1880s. Um, and here he is expounding upon the, the benefits of drinking cocoa. And he can do that because he's a little bit of an expert about such things, because Edwy is actually a chemist. Um, he was born in the 1850s. He married a suffragette. His daughter was a suffragette. And he belonged, if you like, to the men's wing of the suffragettes. And I think I mentioned he did a lot of hostile reconnaissance for them and flagged up um, buildings and premises that they could actually go on to attack. But obviously, as a chemist, he has knowledge. Um, he did actually get convicted in 1913 um, under the Malicious Damage Act. And that was basically on the evidence of some documents that were recovered from the offices of the suffragettes. Uh, he'd written a letter to them basically saying that he was still trying to work on the material that he was developing for them and he hadn't quite got there yet. Um, the strong inference being that he was the one who was experimenting with making homemade explosive. And I certainly think that, that Clayton had played quite a big part in, in the knowledge that the suffragettes had around using explosives and the proper use of explosives um, and probably how to construct them. Now the suffragette campaign finished in 1914. Um, war came and Mrs. Pankhurst decided to adopt another cause, and that was to support the nation in the war effort. And so the suffragette bombings finished. Uh, and it took another war, really, for another campaign, a bombing campaign, to pop up in 1939. And I actually remember my father talking about this. He said that the IRA started to make a nuisance of themselves just before the war, planting bombs and blowing up pillar boxes, which sounds strangely familiar. And as you can see on the left there, that's the effects of a bomb that was planted at Hammersmith Bridge, which subsequently proved to be quite a, quite a favourite with the IRA, really. Um, and they planted bombs in various places um, and including in shops as well. And they had a, a fairly successful campaign, um, but they'd visited London actually earlier. And it was a campaign that's often overlooked. In about the early 1920s, the IRA sent some volunteers across to London um, as part of their campaign to Free Ireland. And they perhaps didn't send their best people, um, but the sort of activities that they indulged in were setting fire to places, including farm buildings and haystacks. They cut telegraph and telephone wires. They att attacked the transport infrastructure. But as I said, the Met didn't really rate them um, as operatives. And this is a quote from a Metropolitan Police report of the time. They, the IRA volunteers, don't even succeed in doing any substantial damage. And then they go on to say, very interestingly, I think, the suffragettes were far better. And so you there have an expert opinion on how good the suffragettes were versus some of the early IRA volunteers. And in that kind of backhanded compliment to the suffragettes, um, I'll finish off this talk. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, thank you very much for St Hilda's for having the opportunity to uh, present the talk this evening. Thank you. Um, thank you.
Oh. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, that was great. It was really interesting. Um, I just want to say, first of all, the plan now is to have a um, Q&A session for 15, 20 minutes um, or so. And just to remind you that you can add a comment um, underneath the YouTube stream um, to, uh, for a question and that'll be passed to me so I can ask Rebecca for you. Um, but I'm going to take Chair's privilege and start with a couple of questions. <laughs> um, so, well, first of all, I just wanted to say, like, as a, just to kind of reiterate that this this kind of approach to this topic is like kind of original. It's kind of related to this kind of turn towards material and urban history, like thinking in this kind of really granular material way about what happened. So this is kind of a really exciting direction in which kind of suffragette history is going. Um, and I particularly found interesting this question of like, how do we situate it within the broad, broader 20th century history, history of what might be referred to as terrorism and, and kind of where they got their skills from. Um, so I, I think that's really fascinating. And I mean, I wondered if you could speculate a little bit more on whether you do think there was any kind of international links in the way there was with the IRA and Fenians. Like, do you think we might uncover like transnational ideas networks between Britain and other countries or like whether you have any thoughts? And the second question is, I just wanted to ask like where you imagine kind of your research developing, like where you want to take this kind of research you've been doing on the suffragettes. Yeah, I lost you on the uh, on the second question there. So I'll uh, I'll deal with the first one first, if you're if you're still hearing me. Yeah, I can hear you now and I'll repeat the second one in a minute. <laughs> OK, um, the first question about international links. Yes, really interesting. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. There were certainly um, sort of Fenians, the anarchists were still around at the time that the, the suffragettes were planting bombs. Um, it isn't unheard of for, if we use the term terrorist groups for the minute, to liaise with other terrorist groups. Because I think probably around about the 1980s or 1990s, a group of IRA operatives um, were arrested, I think, in a South American country where they'd gone over there basically to, to train um, terrorists over in that country. So I think, I think it's, it's likely, although sadly there is no direct evidence that that has actually, actually happened, although it may well be lurking in, a, in an archive somewhere. I haven't uncovered it as yet, but I'd be surprised if, if they hadn't sourced various um, people that they could speak to. Yeah. So... My other question was um, where you kind of envisage taking this research, like if there's what, what you think still needs doing, like what interests you that you haven't researched it on this topic? I think, I, I mean, it, being quite sadly um, interested in bombs, I suppose, I found, it, I found it very interesting with doing the research of going back to the Fenians and how the Fenians constructed bombs um, and how people have made use of things that were actually to hand to fashion bombs out of. So I mentioned about the suffragettes using really household items, whereas the anarchists could perhaps overcomplicate it a little and go and get sort of a specially commissioned pipe made and so arouse suspicion. Um, and I think if I took the research further ahead, I'd be very interested in looking more at, at bomb making and other groups um, and how they shared their expertise, how they collected their expertise and actually learned about bomb building and how they develop the techniques. Yeah. And I, yeah, I was thinking like when you said like they use kind of female domestic objects or they like had to use things they could carry it. I love that kind of those moments in feminist history when it's like a subversive use of like something that's, you know, domestic or like, a, it's really interesting. So we have some qu questions from the audience. Um, so Nicola asks, did, do you think bombs furthered the cause? And that's mm -hmm. either for the suffragettes or the kind of IRA Fenians. Do you think they, do you think bombing furthered the cause? Do you think it engendered more support or do you think it damaged public support? Oh, that's that's quite a tricky one because I suppose the most recent example uh, with the IRA was the, the Bishopsgate bomb, um, the Canary Wharf bombs. And they caused such economic damage um, that it actually started mm -hmm. the government talking to the IRA. Um, so although they probably never admit the fact that, yeah, actually bombing succeeded, that was the trigger that we couldn't actually take such an economic loss again. Um, I think with the suffragettes, I think attitudes were quite hardened towards them because of using the bombs. If they continued with that campaign, if the war hadn't come along, I find it inconceivable that somebody wouldn't have died 
at some stage. Um, and I think that probably would have, any public sympathy they had probably would have been withdrawn at that point, particularly seeing women going around planting bombs uh, that have perhaps caused the death of, of, I say, innocent civilians. But do you think, do you think if they had taken IRA tactics and, and can caused more economic damage, not necessarily physical damage, but economic damage, do you think that that, do you think they almost went, they could, there's one further step they could have taken or, or not? Again, I've lost, I've lost the end, the end of that question. Just asking whether you think if they had taken it a little bit further, like the IRA in terms of economic damage, that might have got them more kind of face time with the government and more taken seriously or. Yeah. It's, it's possible, but I think they would have, they would have struggled um, to have had a campaign like the IRA because of the, I say the lack of in infrastructure, the government knew who they were. They had a base in the UK. The IRA had their base across um, in Ireland. So they were kind of one step removed, if you like. So it was far more, far easier to get a handle on the suffragettes and close them down um, than it perhaps was with the IRA. Yeah, that's an interesting point about them being quite widely known by the police and the authorities, which is true with all the Cat and Mouse, Cat, Cat and Mouse Act and in and out of jail and things. Did, did they ever injure anyone? Someone asked, so Heather asks, or, I mean, I don't think they killed anyone, but was anyone injured? Um, with the, the attacks on the post boxes, um, they would go around setting fire to them, but they also would pour um, noxious liquid into them. And there were instances of postmen um, who, when emptying letter boxes or down at the sorting offices, um, actually being burnt and injured um, by the liquid that the suffragettes used. And did that get quite a lot of publicity or was that pushed up? No, it, it did get quite a lot of publicity at the time. were interested in like if the police found a bomb before it had gone off like what was the protocol with what they <laughs> what they did with it <laughs> nothing like what happens today i mean it's something the, mil the size of the milk can bomb today you would have the street cordoned off and the bomb squad would be full because explosives are, are dangerous things um there are actually some very interesting entries in the um order books of the city of london police about what their officers should do and basically, they say you should pick it up and carry it to a quiet place, um, somewhere remote from members of the public. If it starts to smoke, then try to take the fuse out of it. Um, and later on, when they became aware of um, sort of the electrical fired devices, they did actually say cut the wires. So it's rather reminiscent of the films, you know, where you say, don't cut the blue, cut the red. Um, they'd be advised to, to cut the wires to, to stop the mechanism from firing. So you, you took your life in your hands. And, and again, with the suffragette bombs, just by police officers picking them up and moving them, if those had exploded, they certainly would have been seriously injured, if not killed. Yeah. And killing a police officer would probably have turned the public... Yeah would have really hardened the opinion. Do you think um, that it was a good strategic move to stop that this campaign during the First well, World War? I think the whole of the village of Warnham is probably online now, so you've frozen on me. Oh, you've frozen on me as well. But can you hear me now? No, I've got you back again. I Ooh. think the whole of my village has gone online, actually. <laughs> Hopefully they're watching this. <laughs> Okay, um, so <laughs> someone asked, Paul, Paul asks, was there a debate in the suffragette press about the ethics of taking this action? So was there kind of internal divisions in the press or in their meetings? Yes, there, there was. They had um, quite a high profile supporter whose name I forget now, and, and she was a supporter of theirs. And she actually left the suffragettes um, because she did not believe um, that this sort of direct action should be taken, that it, that it was too dangerous. And I should probably make the point that it wasn't every single suffragette who was going around planting bombs. Um, I think Fern Riddell in her, um, in her book refers to them as the hotheads. So you had like this hardcore of people like Emily Wilding Davidson, yeah. who were quite prepared to do what needed to be done for the cause. And others would be involved at, to certain degrees. But yes, yeah, certainly, certainly one high profile supporter did leave um, because of her concerns over the campaign. Mm -hmm. 
And was there agreement about stopping these tactics in the First World War? Like, was that, or was there debates about that? Can you hear me? No, I can now. I was just wondering whether there was a debate when they suspended these tactics in the First World War or whether that was kind of widely agreed upon. No, from, from what I understand, and it's quite interesting what some of the suffragettes did subsequently, um, they sometimes refer to the cult of the leader. And Mrs Pankhurst, I think, was quite an absolute leader. Um, you did what she wanted, otherwise you were out. And I think it was Sylvia, one of her daughters, actually left the suffragettes at one point because she, she had a falling out with her mother. Um, so I think Mrs Pankhurst decided that's it, we're stopping. So everybody stopped. And interestingly enough, some of the higher profile suffragettes in the run up to World War II became quite ardent supporters of Oswald Mosley and Adolf Hitler. So again, you get this concept of, you know, the, the absolute leader, the cult of the leader. Um, so quite an interesting transition from one leader in Pankhurst through to, to Mosley yeah. and, uh, and Hitler. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard about that before. That would be interesting to follow up on. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Why do you think that the suffragettes chose to attack like religious establishments such as St. Paul's and Westminster Abbey? Was that a particular tactic or? Yeah, the, the church didn't support them. They, they felt that the church should support their cause and the church didn't. Um, so they didn't just attack the big institutions, they would burn down churches around the country as well. Um, and they'd attack St Paul's in other ways, they'd go in and disrupt services and really St, Paul, St Paul's really did clamp down on them in a way that they probably wouldn't today, they'd allow them to protest, but there are accounts of the women being practically dragged out screaming by their hair by employees of St Paul's Cathedral just to get them out of the cathedral. But yeah, it was basically lack of support by the religious establishment. Right. Um, we have a couple of questions about the practicalities of bombs. So one, so someone asked, when did the profession of bomb disposal expert begin? And someone else wants to know whether bombs are kind of still made or it's possible to still make bombs out of these ordinary objects or whether we've kind of developed into more sophisticated techniques for bomb making if you can if you can not, reveal that to the yeah. audience <laughs> um the um the very first question um it was quite a slow process um bomb disposal um there's an exceptionally good book which i have on my bookshelf here called london bombed blitzed and blown up by a chap called ian jones who was a bomb disposal expert um, and if you're interested, it's a fascinating book because he talks about the history of explosives and the regulation of explosives, which originated really with a huge explosion on the Regent's Canal, I think, in about 1850 or 1860, um, and how they developed um, bomb disposal. Because in the early days, what used to happen, they, they set up a bomb disposal place down at Woolwich. Um, so any bombs that they kind of collected, usually a policeman would put it on the back of his bicycle and he'd cycle down to Woolwich with it to have it um, disposed of. Um, and a lot of bombs were brought back to Britain um, with World War I, people would actually post home grenades and things like that as mementos. And at one point there was believed to be so many in London, the government just said, just, just lob it in water, just throw it in the nearest water course. So I dread to think how much um, is, in, is in the Thames. Um, so it probably, it probably wasn't till more recent times, so I'd say probably the IRA campaign, um, that there started to be a more formalised response to bomb disposal. Um, and many of the bomb disposal teams are extra all engineers um, who've done the whole variety of courses in the army, and they'll be paired with um, usually a police officer, a police driver. Um, in the counties, they tend to use the Royal Navy, um, whereas in London, we have a, a, a dedicated bomb disposals. Um, now the second question, how do I answer that? Uh, I think what, what I would say is that having, being a pollster, I get through reports from various places on um, bomb finds around the country. And we do still have people who sit in their garden sheds, probably taking fireworks to pieces and experimenting, and very often blowing bits of themselves off through experimenting. So again, please don't try this at home. But 
But bombs are, I say they're simple to make. You need five things to make a bomb. Um, and a container is one of them. And the suffragettes just happened to pick milk cans and mustard tins and bicycle belts. Okay, I think that's an interesting way to, to leave our discussion. So we'll kind of have that as the final, final thoughts in all our minds. Um, and thank you so much for giving the um, talk today and apologies for the slightly um, iffy connection, but hopefully everyone's been able to get hear, hear most of what we said. So thank you and night everyone.